Th thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, we, we are big Saints, and uh, as you are Saints and LSU fans, and uh, for my friends in Alabama in the room, if you could be easy on us this Saturday night, we would appreciate that. Um, I, Mark, I do appreciate, first off, the comments about the flood. I, I just, um, in the hurricane system, there are tremendous numbers of CPAs that will be impacted um, by what has happened in the Northeast, really, from everywhere, from, from D.C. all the way up to Boston, or, or Massachusetts in general. And um, very significant flooding, some still occurring this morning. Just to give you a couple of points of reference, uh, if you know of anyone, and I know a lot of the state boards in the room uh, might be affected as well, a lot of the licensees, uh, there is a host of, of free materials available on AICPA.org for uh, disaster recovery that CPAs can use for their clients. Uh, it's been time tested, unfortunately, because of the number of disasters we've had in this country over the last several years. And so I just call that to your attention. There's also a part of the website that CPA Help a CPA uh, because we know that there will be some firms that have some very significant uh, issues from that standpoint. Um, some of them probably from our early reports look like and they've had some flooding in, in firms and obviously they lose technology and a whole host of people that are out of, uh, uh, out of power. We know we have a lot of employees in that area you know, that have had flooding Obviously, our CPA exam office is in, uh, in Ewing, New Jersey, Princeton, New Jersey area, which uh, obviously has a lot of people who have potential for being impacted. So it's still sketchy reports, but it's a very serious situation. I was going to make light of it and say that um, this is the third, in the last four years, this is the third time I've prepared for a hurricane uh, in New York. And I was going to tease Mark a little bit and say that he better be ready for, uh, be prepared for snow in South Louisiana. Uh, because it looks like the whole sort of ecosystem has reversed itself, but uh, it's certainly not a joking matter this morning in, in New York City. I do want to start off with the same words that uh, Rich Catarano uh, shared about our relationship with NASPA um, and then get into a little bit about um, the landscape of firms and the definition of a test. I think something that we can really work on together. Mark, when I heard you introduce all the uh, past chairs here, so many of them have been part of our of our working together, our summit meetings. And, you know, I, I just want to thank NASBA and its leadership, Ken Bishop, who's done a great job in this past year, David, before. Um, there are so many things that we work constructively on. Um, sometimes, you know, some difficult issues we work, we, we roll up our sleeves and work together on. Um, but uh, in the spirit of doing the right thing and trying to get to good outcomes that position the profession, to serve the public in the long term. Uh, and I know that that will continue with, with Galen and Carlos um, and our chairs, um, uh, Rich Catarano and Bill Bauhoff, all committed for that same kind of thing. And so I know it's equally important with the state societies and the state boards, uh, even our friends in Canada here as we look at cross-border issues. Uh, and it's just, there are just so many opportunities and so many really challenges uh, in the world and in the, in, the, in the business community and the entrepreneurial world that we serve, that it is in the best interest of that entrepreneurial community, the users of, and investors in those companies, and obviously the profession as well, to just continue to work hard on those uh, points. And one of the message points I have this morning is one that will be hard to work on as well, but we believe that it's, it's sort of um, now or never if we want to really take it on. I thought I'd spend just a few moments looking at the landscape of the profession, and this is admittedly from a public accounting perspective as opposed to a business and industry perspective. And I know all of you in your individual states see it in a different form or fashion. Um, clearly what is happening today is an emerging uh, second tier or next tier of firms that is going to be very dynamic in our country, very dynamic in the globe. Um, and what I have been saying for some time is that within a very short order, I believe that we will have about a dozen half billion or larger firms, half billion dollar revenue or larger firms in the United States, exclusive of the big four. There is a huge amount of mergers going on at the top end. There, there, there are mergers happening in each strata of our profession from a size perspective. Typically today, what I would call horizontal mergers, sort of similar size firms, some, uh, some vertical mergers still occurring, but for the most part, that was a phenomenon that was with us for the last maybe three or four years and not so much today. 
And so this emerging sort of uh, second tier of firms, uh, actually if you study the history of the profession, if you go back and look at what really firms look like in the 60s and the 70s that later became the, the, the big eight firms, uh, in many instances, and in virtually all these instances, these firms will be larger than those firms were at that particular time. They certainly aren't going to become a big five or big six, not in, in the short order, because there's a huge gap in size. But they're going to be very significant firms in the marketplace and very significant firms from a global perspective. And clearly, international is, is driving those, uh, a lot of that, but it's not all. All of these points in this slide are driving what's really happening. But clearly, emerging markets, uh, buying and, and selling overseas is, is, a, is a critical element. Almost all of these firms, really all of the top, close to all the top 500 firms in the United States have very significant international components or, or associations as they serve multinational uh, client bases where, where clients have activities that are going on outside of the United States on a regular basis. Uh, in many instances, those are very complex and that sort of networking is very important. Now, I think it's also important to remember that if we look at history, the global networks that exist today have predominantly emerged from the US and the UK. I think as history moves forward, um, into the future, we're going to see some of these, these networks on a global basis be emerging from other places. There are clearly significant pushes in other places in the world, particularly Asia, that some of these global networks will have you know, Asian names or, or Chinese names, et cetera, and will be forces on the global marketplace of firms. Technology is obviously driving a lot of these activities as well. Cloud computing is probably the most transformative aspect of the practice of public accounting in the United States and, and increasingly in the world um, since really the introduction of the microcomputer effectively in the early 1980s. That was transformative to practices. It got, it got firm in, in the 1980s, it, it moved uh, practices away from what we would call business process outsourcing today, which you might have called monthly accounting work at that point. <clears throat> the whole economics of that environment changed significantly and firms became something else in that particular process. Today, cloud computing is transformatively bringing that back in and a different price point, a different technology set. <clears throat> cloud computing is allowing these firms to really be business process outsourcing much like we were in the 1980s, but with a different, a different skill set <clears throat> excuse me, and a big uh, element of different uh, um, uh, profitability or cost savings to clients. Just to give you an example of that, one of the major mergers in the United States uh, for a uh, merger of two top 15 firms, uh, when they announced their merger about a year ago, they said, we're going to market with three basic strategies. One strategy is obviously traditional accounting firm, what a traditional accounting firm looks like, tax and audit and those types of things. One is in the financial planning or, or wealth management area, and the third is in business processing, business process outsourcing powered by the cloud. And so this is a top 10 firm today that has said one of their three major strategies is in that particular area. Now with that type of cloud computing capabilities, not only does the efficiencies change, not only does the price point change, the services that we provide to clients change, but also a whole new set of technology challenges identity theft being a, a key one, security in general. Technology security is, is a huge element of our society. Um, you know, government leaders, et cetera, would tell you that that um, is probably the greatest security threat um, in addition to a lot of the other things that our, our government leaders deal with. Security uh, threats are gonna be a huge element and the profession's gonna have a very significant uh, uh, challenge here. Value proposition. Uh, there is a challenge from a value proposition perspective. Uh, you know, when we look at what is in, envisioned in a set of financial statements today, there's a lot of users of those financial statements, and particularly on the private company side, banks, which are the primary users of those financial statements, saying, I don't quite get it. I don't quite see the same value proposition in those types of things. It's too complex. Obviously, in the big company level, same messages come across. Uh, extraordinarily complex. The world is complex. But we have a very unique and difficult set of facts here that <clears throat> we continue to have to manage. The profession, broadly speaking, obviously including regulators, 
uh, is very important to manage. Easy, uh, if we don't manage that well over the next decade, the whole notion of our core product line will be challenged from a value perspective. You can imagine if you want to take a risk management approach, if we as a group spent the, the rest of the day with a bunch of flip charts on the walls and said we were going to do risk management for the profession, the utility of our core service, a financial statement, would be very high up in that particular environment. And so that's why it's a big issue from the Institute's perspective. It's a big issue, obviously, on NASBA's agenda. It is a huge element of what we will look like or not look like in the future, and firms are wrestling with that as well. People is a big issue. Rich talked a lot about the diversity issue from the positioning of the profession in the future. We have to solve the diversity point. I think Rich made those points very eloquently. We have to be a profession that looks like how the ownership of entrepreneurial capital is reflected in the marketplace. And that's changing dramatically. But in addition to that, in the near term, firms are facing huge people challenges. While we know from the work that we do with, with, uh, jointly with NASBA and Prometric on the CPA exam, we know the numbers that are coming through the CPA exam. Basically, all classrooms and accounting are full in the United States. It's a good message. It's been like that for about five or six years. Accounting is clearly viewed as one of the most recession-proof jobs in America. In any poll, it would be in the top three. Um, at the height of unemployment in the United States, we were about a third. The profession had about a third the unemployment rate as the national uh, average for unemployment, which essentially is full employment in the profession. Those are all good facts, but the war for talent is still going to be a very significant war for talent. If we want to replace CPAs one for one over the next decade, we actually have to be able to stand up here 10 years from now and say, we've had record numbers coming in accounting, not for the last five years, but for the last 15 years. So in other words, we've got to do it again for another decade if we're going to be successful in replacing CPAs one for one with the, just the generational dynamics that is going through the pipeline. Firms are facing huge level as the economy improves every so slightly, um, it's huge turnover issues um, in that particular environment. Clearly today, for those of you who grew up in the profession, if you remember being in the profession in the, in the 80s or, or so, you would never hear of a bigger firm hiring from a smaller firm. You would never hear of then the big eight hiring from an, uh, a top 50 firm, let's say. It was rare. You could have probably counted on one hand the number of times that that occurred anywhere in the United States in the mid 80s. Today, it's extraordinarily co uh, common. Larger firms hiring from the staff of smaller firms is a very, very common environment. Partners moving out of larger firms to smaller firms, going in the other direction, which, is, which was also prevalent in the 1980s. So talent is moving sort of in almost in a fungible way and creating huge challenges of how do we manage that, how do we deal with those particular elements. And clearly turnover in the profession is a major issue today. And, and for instance, on the diversity side, even when we attract diverse populations into the profession, the firms in general, the profession in general, is having a hard time keeping them in the profession long term. They're moving into other areas. And this generation is motivated by entrepreneurism, so they're entering in the profession, and whereas in the 1980s, they might have left a firm and go to a smaller firm, today they're leaving the firm and never to be touching accounting again. And they're becoming entrepreneurs and seeing other op opportunities out there. And those are challenges to the long-term lifeblood of the profession in the firms. Now, succession is a major issue as well in all of these firms. Um, by various accounts, let's call it 44,000 firms in the United States. Um, the 500th largest firm in the United States has about 20 CPAs in them. So a huge skewing to very tiny CPA firms still. The most common element of those firms, uh, the, the smaller firms, those 40, say 43,500 firms, is that they're led by a baby boomer. And the most common element of that is the two biggest assets that baby boomer has is the investment in their firm and their house. And we all know what's happened to housing values and we can predict what's very, how difficult it is to get out of a firm that size today in the marketplace with the huge volume of ownership transitions that's really going to be, that's going to be changing. And I'll talk about um, succession in, uh, in the next slide as well. From a client perspective, Obviously, fee pressure is a huge element, uh, and it's not my job to talk about fees from that standpoint other than just give you that data point. Uh, obviously, clients, to a large degree, the feedback we get from firms of all sizes is that we have an economy in which entrepreneurism is waiting, waiting. 
you know, waiting on Washington, waiting on tax reform, waiting on regulation, et cetera. And so there's, there's potential for some pent up um, activity there, but there's not a lot of activity that's taking place in that particular environment. One of the consistent messages uh, we give to, um, to Washington as far as feedback from practitioners is this sort of par paralysis that exists on Main Street today. Um, you, you heard from uh, PCOB member Ferguson yesterday in the, in the issue of mandatory firm rotation. Our position is that mandatory rotation is, is, is not going to fix whatever they believe to be a problem from that standpoint. But irrespective of where your belief is on that, the fact is, is that it is cascading down in the private sector. It's cascading down big time into the private sector. I repeatedly get calls from firms. Where, where there are small business clients, because of the debate that's happening in Washington, that might be, you know, might have boards, certainly in the not-for-profit world, et cetera, the issue is saying, well, they're talking about mandatory rotation in New York and Washington. Should we have some, some, uh, some of that effect? Should we do that at our, for, with your relationship, with your client is asking that with smaller firms? And obviously, smaller firms are very concerned about that. So for us to believe that even if something were enacted, that it would be contained and some set, some, some set of public companies or even all public companies is just not the way the marketplace will ultimately work from that standpoint, which would have huge implications to the personnel components of the profession. If you could imagine if you're auditing a big company and you have constant, let's pick a period of time, 10 years is what's being talked about as a compromise in Europe, and complete turnover of those staffs throughout the world, the human capital implications to the profession will be very dramatic. So we'll have to see how that's playing out, but, but do not believe for a second that it's just a public company uh, world. And so from our own study of firms, firms are recovering uh, better than 2010, but not yet to 2008. Uh, the, um, the, the vast majority of firms have experienced year-to-year -year revenue growth in 2012, uh, compensation inching up. Um, clearly, larger firms are trying to begin to address the succession issue throughout their partner ranks, and they're adding partners to be able to deal with that uh, in that element. And the last data point that says 46% of firms have a formal succession plan up from 35% in 2008. That's a good message, but you have to so sort of like all the polling data we're getting on the elections today. You sometimes have to sort of roll that back and really understand you know, what kind of poll it was, who was being polled, what are the demographics in the poll, et cetera. And in this one, you have to peel back the onion just slightly as well. Because while 46% of firms say they, quote, have a formal succession plan, less than half of those, or less than 25% overall, have actually done anything with it. And so when you talk about people having a plan, yeah, I've thought about it as my plan, or I have a partnership agreement that says this is, this is how it's going to work, the actual thinking about who will lead the audit practice, who will lead the tax practice, who will be the next generation CEO, et cetera, less than 25% of the firms in the United States have actually done anything about that, and it's a huge generational issue. Now, if we look at the, if we look at the landscape of opportunities and where the profession is going, these are just a bunch of items from that standpoint. Uh, clearly, sustainability reporting, the rest of the world is further ahead than us. For instance, in South Africa today, a company reports on a three-component element, what we would call the traditional financial statements. They also report on what, we, what would be the sustainability, not environmental sustainability, but the sustainability of the business. Management uh, reports and the, and the, and the audit firm uh, attests to their assessment of the ability for the firm to continue to operate, whether it has supply channels and business sense, uh, business uh, um, uh, capability, and a whole set, you know, do they have all the financial factors aligned as well. And then the third element is their environmental footprint. What is, are their net contributors and net users of the, of the resources of, in their vernacular, planet Earth? Um, or not. This is an emerging area of reporting of how the picture will look. Actually, Asia is much ahead of us as well. Um, and it is something that is being worked on very dramatically by the profession on an international basis. Something called the International Integrated Reporting Council has pilots out there in almost 100 different firms. And when I say firms here, I'm meaning companies, clients of, C of CPA firms around the world. Some are piloting in the US. The, the vast majority of them are piloting outside of the US. Different reporting models, different notions of how to get a broader element. 
One of the key elements of where I'm going to go on the definition of attest is sort of the attestation standards. What we're seeing is a world today in which attestation is moving away from just financial information to a much more dramatic footprint. And sustainability or integrated reporting falls into that, for instance, in the South African example, but also in technology and cloud computing where firms are increasingly in our own SOC standards, which was formerly the SAS 70 reports, which was targeted to basically a two-party relationship and was really fo focused on only financial controls. Today, attestation in a cloud computing world is about attestation in a broad array of what's important to users in that perspective. What's important is financial controls, but also it's important is security controls, confidentiality controls, technology reliability controls, et cetera, in a business environment. And in a cloud computing world, the provider of that service wants to be able to get a report and communicate that to their customer base, just like a company that might be seeking investors wants to report their financial statements to a broader base. Well, this is their business model and they want to be able to report it. And a user of that service, a customer of that service, wants to know that when they're using someone who's providing different types of technology solutions, that they can feel some confidence about this, the, the technology integrity, the, the, the confidentiality integrity in those particular areas. Obviously, risk management is a huge growing area, including some assertions on process related to risk management. Taxes are going to be a huge element and a very, uh, a very complicated element for the CPA profession going forward. For all of you who are in public practice and you deal with your partners, your tax partners will be going through a very unsettled tax season this year. Because the uncertainty, and we could, we could talk to uh, Congressman Conaway here, what happens or doesn't happen during the lame duck session is not likely to give us any real certainty from a planning perspective as you deal with clients. And your tax partners are going to go through a high degree of stress on that particular issue. And, and to the extent that Congress acts and can reach a compromise, which is obviously dependent on, on what that might look like on the results of the election, um, there is a good chance that that compromise is somewhat of a band-aid and then in 2013 a more permanent debate being taking place from that standpoint. So when you sitting down or your partners are sitting down with clients, be it corporate clients or individual clients, in January, February, and March, there's going to be a huge degree of uncertainty related to that, maybe the greatest degree of uncertainty that a CPA has ever faced in tax season. And so it's going to be a very stressful and evolving area. And then top it off, because ultimately we will get to some permanent solutions, you would think, and so that's a huge change management element. The business process outsourcing I've mentioned, uh, and clearly firms of all sizes are specializing. Now, XBRL is an interesting element as well. Today we're seeing growth in XBRL uh, and the use of, of sending and providing information in a much different digital type of capability. It's required by the SEC for public companies today. That has been phased in over a three-year period of time. Um, there, is a, there is a piece of legislation pending in the, at the federal level called the Data Act, uh, championed by Congressman Issa, uh, who is, who is as knowledgeable on this subject as is, is probably anyone in the profession. Um, and the, the legislation, if it is ultimately uh, passed, and it could pass during the lame duck session, basically would, would mandate of all federal agencies a certain reporting style of information using, and it doesn't say the four, four letters XBRL, extensible business reporting language, but it defines the criteria of what that type of platform would be to essentially be XBRL. And so we could see a major push inside federal government uh, from that particular standpoint. The, there are other elements on uh, uh, corporate actions and things of that nature, dividends and stock splits and stock uh, changes that are going to probably uh, go to XBRL with the SEC. And so we're continuing to see that type of evolution. And we're beginning to see signs of the banking community using or requiring XBRL in limited occasions, which we think will grow for the transmission of private company information into their credit analyst process. And so we think that that will be uh, a notion. So attestation is evolving very dramatically. And you know, clearly, if we look at it historically, attestation services were generally limited to the audit, right? Re audits are reviews of historical financial statements. In recent years, CPAs have, have increasingly been asked for this broader footprint. And we believe that that's a trend that is not likely to slow down. 
that we can just imagine where, how fast things are moving from a technology perspective, et cetera, that that's going to play uh, a big part in the future footprint. And there are some regulatory issues associated with that uh, that you know, I think we really need to have a strong discussion about and collectively come to some solutions on from that element. I would also say that the audit itself will change dramatically. Uh, the whole notion of how we deploy uh, and through the standards process, uh, sampling and things of that nature, where technology is changing the landscape of that dramatically. You know, we're not too far away from the notion of no longer sampling, but instead with technology being able to look at entire populations of transactions in order to reach conclusions from an audit or an attestation perspective. Technology gives us the capability of doing that, and while audits clearly always will be done by the human factor, the individual and the judgment and the professionalism that comes into that element, the use of technology in that environment is going to change the whole notion of what uh, the audit process might look like, and it's already being experimented with around the world. And so these emerging areas of sustainability reporting, uh, attestation of, over XBRL tag data, even uh, attestation over investment portfolio returns, which is, you know, as, as we see the transfer of wealth and we see uh, benchmarks being used in that, we're seeing an expansion from that standpoint. And then the whole notion of system reliability in these SOC reporting areas uh, are just, you know, four major ones that are in play from that standpoint. Now, our current definition of ad test in the UAA, the joint definition that agreed by AICPA and NASMA, and I acknowledge that this is not the definition in every jurisdiction's law. So as we know, we've done a great job with mobility, and thank you all for your work from that standpoint. And, you know, a, a big joint congratulations to all of us, state society, state boards, NASBA, AICPA, the, the Accountants Coalition, and everyone that has helped to get us to the point that we are. I think if we would have been having this, if I'd have been speaking six years ago, and I remember when David and I launched this, people would say, no way would we be here in 2012. But we are here, and I think that that message applies to this definition of ad test as well. We have to imagine what the profession will be doing and what's the right regulatory balance in that environment. And you heard Rich say, we are for, which we know is a major initiative of NASBA, strong state boards in this process. That is a component part of us delivering as a profession on our mission and our obligation to the public. That is an important part. And, but also how we define things in state laws and state rules is an important part as well. And this definition is very focused on financial information in a world in which other information, other business information is increasingly becoming more and more important in the decision making process. And so the public relies on the CPA for audit and the test and in, and in fact, that is, a, that is how under state laws, everyone's state laws, those types of services can be delivered is through um, the CPA, who, is, who through a licensed CPA, in most of the cases, a licensed firm, um, or require, you know, depending on the different states' definitions there, who demonstrate competence and qualifications. That's how we deliver on this definition of ad test. But is the definition of ad test broad enough? And so, um, when we look at uh, the, you know, the UAA and, and really what it means, it's, it really focuses on concerning financial statements, licensees report concerning financial statements. There is a bias to all of these definitions in our UAA wording and in the regulatory components of states to financial information. Now herein lies just the fundamental challenge that I think state boards face, but it also is a challenge from a CPA firm perspective. The fundamental challenge is when you look at our standards on SOC reporting, which is a broad definition, again, of these other types of, of reliability type concepts in, in cloud computing, technology, et cetera, which incorporate to some degree financial controls, but not necessarily solely financial controls. There, there are beginning to be signs of other individuals providing services and either referencing those standards or referencing something very close to those standards and providing services to the public in that space and it's not services that are solely CPA services. And so the question for you and the question for us might be different but the challenge is still the same. The question for you is how will I answer the, the complaint when the, the, the 
two identical services can be provided in clearly something that touches reliability of business information, and one is performed by a CPA firm, and one is performed by someone else, and the, and the complaining public says, well, this somebody else did this work, and you don't have any kind of regulatory authority on that because it's not restricted under the definition of a test. And of course, the, the issue from the CPA profession, solely looking at it, is to say, these, this is work that is being done, the, the, the competencies, the ethical commitment, the reputation, the, the passion and quality of the CPA profession is what's really driving these things, yet commercial providers, let's call them, are also potentially providing these same types of services, and is that the right outcome? Clearly that's the right outcome in other areas like tax, but we think in the ad test area, the ad test area around business information, that that might not be the right answer. And so the public relies on the CPAs for financial statements. The public is increasingly looking at reports and other subject matter, and should the public be protected in the same way in both of those elements. And the discussion we had, and I know Ken referenced in his remarks, the discussion that we had at, this, at our uh, semi-annual uh, summit meeting was along, uh, a good part of that meeting was about this particular topic. And, and while we have journeys to go, and it's hard, hard work to do this, it's hard work to do this, uh, there was a, essentially a meeting of the minds of both leadership groups to say that we need to, like my presentation today, like Ken's comments yesterday, we need to begin in short order having the discussion about whether this is right. I've started the process with the state societies, and, and if we want to redefine that test, the time to redefine that test in this area is today. Because the ability to do it in five years as this evolves much more rapidly, based on everything that we're seeing, is going to be almost zero. It's sort of a now or never, and I recognize now is not you know, two weeks, but now is a relatively short period of time, as opposed to waiting and talking about it for three or four or five years, and then saying, gee, I wish we'd have done that. We have to make a, a decision. From, from a regulatory perspective, from a professions perspective, state society, state boards, the whole group of people, we have to make a decision if we're gonna do the heavy lifting, the heavy work, just like we did with mobility, if we're gonna do that. And if we're gonna do it, we can't take forever to make that decision. And so we think it's a very important element. These are just some of the other things that are going on as you might think about it from a broad perspective. Examining greenhouse gas protocol, performing agreed upon procedures as I mentioned on XBRL, service organization controls. Those things are continuing to grow from that standpoint. Some specific examples where CPA firms and non-CPA firms have been you know, evidence in that particular area where they've been hired. This is real world stuff, it's happening. It's not theory, it's not ivory tower, it's not anything other than it is happening in the marketplace. And so if it's happening, we, we ought to be envisioning five years from now and 10 years from now collectively and making that particular answer. And so the emerging implications really are how do we best protect the public interest? We know that that's the number one thing when you come to this conference and you, you take on you know, your roles as state board members, et cetera, are focused on. And, and that's appropriate and we get that. We understand that, we respect that, and we support that. And, but in that context, it is a changing and evolving world that we really need to look at the hard at the definition of ad test. And we believe that we should move that definition of ad test to incorporate this broader business financial reporting footprint, not just the financial reporting footprint. And we think that that will have huge ramifications in the long run. Now, clearly consumers can see, uh, will be benefited from that. Uh, you know, the quality of these things, there are gonna be issues associated with these things. And there are gonna be complaints with these, the, these activities. All you have to look at is the identity theft issue in the tax return process if you don't believe that that's a major element. And clearly, CPAs are subject to legal and, and quality requirements, and they should be, and that's okay. And in doing so, we think that that's the right way to go. Now, there is another option for us. We could try to in, in, go through a process of trying to enforce the copyrights, intellectual property rights on some of these standards. It's not a perfect answer. We think it's a better answer in the definition of ad test. 
The reason why it's not a perfect answer is because to the extent that you try to do that by enforcing copyright laws to only CPAs performing these services, what it creates is an environment in which someone else just sets nearly identical standards and performs against those standards of which it would be confusing to the public from that standpoint. So it's not a panacea. We think the bet, we, we are willing to take that approach, but we don't think that it's a panacea to really protecting the public and positioning the concept of attestation in a broader footprint uh, in, a, in a longer uh, notion. So the purpose of these standards is to make sure that we have the right kind of services, the right kind of ethics, the right kind of competencies in being able to provide those services. Um, and so we take that very seriously, and we think the public protection is very serious from that standpoint. And obviously, we believe CPAs are uniquely qualified in these areas. Uh, that's what we do. That is the sweet spot of what we do. We look at standards, like accounting standards. We apply professional judgment, competency, and ethics to the element of whether to determine whether or not those elements have been actually complied with. And then we provide assurance to third parties under the regulatory structures that you have dominion over uh, to the user, ultimately, of that particular information. And that's where this is growing in these broader footprints today. So it warrants careful consideration. Not long-term consideration, but careful consideration. But our message, my message to you today, is that we need to rapidly make this decision. We need to acknowledge that if we are going to go down this path of changing the definition of ad test, that it's going to be hard work. There are going to be people who push on the edges, and we can't get sort of turned off the minute we hear one little pushback from that particular standpoint. The world doesn't operate in that world today. We've got to be willing to have the sort of the, the, the consistency and the commitment to make it happen from that element. And, and if, we, if we have agreement on that, just like we did on mobility, then we've got to get about it, the business seriously, jointly, working together to make that happen um, as consistently as we possibly can on a state-by-state -state basis to achieve a picture, an outcome that is important based on how business information, business reporting, and the attestation over that is evolving, not only here in the United States, but in the world. We think it's, it is the most important sort of regulatory professional touch point that we face today. And my message here is, just like we had the message with NASPA, this isn't, we're not here saying this is absolutely, you know, the only possible answer. I alluded to you that there are other answers. We think it's the best answer. And the dialogue we had at the NASBA Summit meeting, I think we came to a meeting of the minds on that. But now we've got to decide if we want to do the hard work and whether or not we can get consensus and reach agreement on that particular point. So in closing, I appreciate, Mark, the opportunity to be here, the NASBA relationship, the state board relationship. I appreciate your attention in listening to this. And I would like to just close with this thought. There are a lot, the world we live in is very complex. It's complex to regulate it, it's, complica it's complicated to perform against the services, it's changing at such a fast pace. The opportunities are great and the risks are great. But what I have found as I travel around the country and around the world is that our profession's passion is throughout every level of the ranks of our profession. People wake up in our profession every morning wanting to do the right thing, wanting to serve as the mission of state boards would be the public interest. And yes, doing it in a context that they're running a firm and it is part of a business. There's no question about that. It's not an altruistic activity from that standpoint. But people want to do the right thing. And it is important that we continue to evolve our regulatory process in which there is a framework in which they can do the right thing, the public can be protected, and this relationship really does exist. I don't buy for a second when we hear people get up and make statements that you know, there is some unscrupulous attempt by the profession as a, as a whole. I firmly believe, however number of CPAs there is in this country, let's just for the sake of argument say there is 450,000. You cannot find a better group of 450,000 of anything from a competency, passion, credibility, ethical standpoint than the 450,000 CPAs. That's something we should be proud of. That's something that we should defend. Yes, we have wink links, but as a whole, we have an incredibly effective profession. We have an incredibly effective structure, 
and one that if we continue to change with the times and evolve, we can be standing up here 10 years, 15, 20, 50 years from now and be able to say the exact same thing. Thank you very much.